Great, right, thank you. Thank you ever so much. So, um, I'm going to do something completely different. I'm not going to give you a detailed scientific uh, talk. I'm going to tell you how Malcolm interacted with us in EDF Energy um, over a large number of years because I was in the CGB, then Nuclear Electric, we changed our name. But we did lots of research work with Malcolm over the, over the years. Um, so when I sent through the title of the talk, which was, it was just an ac academic exercise that meant something to nuclear safety, I missed out one vital word, which was, <laughs> it was not an academic <laughs> exercise. So I'm going to take you through some of the work that, that, that we've been doing, uh, and I've also put in a couple of pictures, maybe show some movies, see what we can do if we can keep your attention between now and lunch. I realise I've got a difficult slot to fill, so that's what we're going to go and do. Um, and after lunch, Irene is going to talk more, more, more about that. So essentially, it's the rug, token buckle, which Malcolm worked, he did that work for us with the research students. Um, and at, at, the, at the bottom is, is also a, a defect called a spiral interstitial, and I had the pleasure of being one of those atoms in a lecture. <laughs> turn around. So yes, so thank you, Malcolm. And it was always good to get called up to the front to go and, and do this. And the other thing that's worth um, I'd like to mention is, um, yeah, we, we sponsored quite a lot of PhDs and postdocs work. Wherever Malcolm moved to, we stuck with him and we supported as the work he went through. But the other bit we're going to talk about is the, um, he was part of a technical committee um, that gave advice back to me as part of the company. Um, and I always valued it, it was important to get that advice back because we do a lot of work. And I think in very simple terms, there's about 250 people working on the project. Very big project, lots of technical work, and it's important to get some external commentary. And I always valued the advice I got back from Malcolm. And apart from that, we had some good times as well. I brought one of the, the booklets. We ended up going to uh, the House of Lords to chat about the Royal Society and how chemistry played a part. That was, that, that was a good, good, fun couple of days out. We also went to the Royal Society. Um, and of course, and we had many trips out to Vienna, where Malcolm always made sure we had a good time, both during the day, talking about the work, and then in the evenings, uh, going out and sampling the food in whatever city we happened to be in for the conference. So... The graphite reactors are gas-cooled in the UK, and we've got graphite in the core, and it's the irradiation damage of the graphite that we were interested in, and that's where we had the link into the research that Malcolm was involved in. So we had some older reactors, Magnox reactors, we're looking after uh, 12, sorry, 14, got to get the number right, 14 that are operating at the moment. And it will set the lifetime for this current generation of reactors. So when they stop, we need to either generate electricity a different way or build new power stations. We've got to make sure that, that we do, do the right work to show that they are safe to operate now. Um, and I'm going to just talk about some of the work and the detail that we've done. Um, if anyone's interested and you want to go and look, they're all dotted around the countryside. And there's always opportunities to go and have a look and see where they are and what they do. But our challenge is unique because we're sort of in, in this country, as ever, we do things differently. So we've built some reactors that are not like anywhere else in the world. So we're on our own. So we have to do our own research. We have to do our own assessment. So we need to then convince people we've done the right work. And so it's quite an interesting project to be involved in. I've gone the wrong way, haven't I? Let me go back to there. There we are. And there's also a large number of other old, old reactors, because graphite was a very good moderator to use. 
So quite a lot of reactors within the world had graphite. So the work was quite very interesting and useful. Um, and Malcolm was always keen to, to fly the flag <laughs> whenever we got the opportunity. So what happens in, a, in the reactor? So essentially the, the, the fission happens, uranium splits into two, we get some fast neutrons. And the idea is the neutron then collides with the carbon atoms. And that's what slows them down to allow the chain reaction to continue. And it's that irradiation damage, the carbon atoms being knocked out, that we were interested in. Because what happens is that those, those dislocations, the irradiation damage that we produce, change the properties of graphite. So it shrinks and it eventually grows. Uh, the strength changes, the Young's modulus changes, possibly the only thing that remains the same is the colour. Um, but it was this ageing that we used the work for Malcolm to help us. And I think that's the displacements I've mentioned. So, because the graphite changes size, it shrinks. When you started off with quite a nice regular structure, over time those dimensional changes will cause stresses to be built up in the bricks. And understanding whether it changed with neutron dose and how much neutron dose or what was the dose rate or what was the temperature, understanding that fundamental science was really important to us. I always made sure wherever we went that Malcolm was always very cheerful. Um, I think that is a bottle of water for once he's opened it up. <laughs> but he was always keen to join in the lively debates that we had. But the degradation changes the behaviour of the graphite in the core. And though the core is tolerant to damage, we need to understand. And so we look at fuel bricks, and I've got some pictures coming up of fuel bricks, and we set up stresses, and those stresses then could cause the bricks to crack. And it's like a big jigsaw, where if a brick cracks, we start to make it a bit slacker, and if too many crack, then the structure could move, and that's what we were trying to understand. So our work also went from the atomic level to the, the civil structure of the whole core. So we were going over a quite a big length scale to try to understand what was going on. Um, and there's a picture of a typical reactor where there's a core made of graphite in the middle, the fuel goes in there. You have some heat exchangers around the side to take away the heat. And we're trying to understand what's happening in the core of the reactor and some pictures of when they were built. I don't think that that was, was Malcolm there. But it gives you an idea of the scale. So these are the graphites, made of graphite bricks, and inside those big cylinders is where we put the fuel. And in between, the, you can't quite see them because it's the wrong height, but in here, there are some other holes where we put the control rods to control the reactor. And then I think you can see some of those interstitial bricks there. So, first one, let's see if this works. Let's go full screen. Let's press play. How does that look? So th this is just an animation of how a graphite core is put together. Again, to make it nice, we coloured the bricks, different colour really. They were all graphite grey, it would be a lot more boring. But we can see the fuel bricks in blue, the interstitial bricks we've coloured in red, and they're all connected by these keys that are going in. And it's this keying system and the damage to the graphite that we're trying to understand what happens. So there's a little bit of the array. And overall, there are 300 channels in the core. And then there are 10 layers of the bricks. That worked. Phew, thank goodness. <laughs> Let's see how we go on with some others. And there's, there's a, a photograph 
So this is what we call the pile cap, and the fuel can get put in here. And it's underneath where we have the graphite core. And there's another picture. And this gives you an idea of the numbers of channels that we've got in there. So yeah, the irradiation damage is really important to us. So one of the things we also wanted to do was age the graphite. So can we get some graphite and measure the properties and we've accelerated the age? So the way that we do that is you have a material test reactor experiment and you take your little bits of graphite and you put them very close to fuel. And then in one year, you can get 10 years of aging in our reactor. And that's what we did. But you need to understand the science behind it, because if you're accelerating the aging, where you get the temperature right, where you get the damage in the right way, that when you got the measurements of the properties, you could use them. And again, Malcolm was really helpful in that, and trying to understand that we were doing the work at the right temperature under the right conditions. So, what's happened? So I've been at a very interesting time um, recently, because some of our reactors are off because of cracks and we're in the news. So I'll just show you some more pictures, some more animation about this late life cracking of bricks. So here's a, this is just a picture of a, a plastic array we've made in quarter scale. And this is at uh, Bristol University. And we've made up a quarter scale of the whole core, and it's on a shaker table. And we can shake this structure and measure what happens, and then we can crack the plastic bricks, and then understand what happens as we crack more to underwrite the behavior. So, there are about 3,000 bricks in a reactor, and we've shown we can, we can tolerate at least a third of them cracked in two halves, and there is no safety issue. And currently, we've only got about 100 of them, so that's the technical work of what we're doing. So I now need to switch, so let's see if I can connect to the internet. Are we okay so far, by the way? What we're doing? Yeah? Um, so yeah, if you just type in, the, 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 this is the name of um, one of the reactors, Munsterstone B Graphite, um, and you can see there's quite a few links to it. Now, I don't think I've got on this page, um, but, but obviously uh, the cracking, we've released the information, it's, it's relevant, um, and you can see there's headlines in the Telegraph, and the, and the Guardian, uh, the Times, you know it's serious when it's in the sun. <laughs> um, I think the sun, sun headline had cracks in big, big, big letters. Um, so what we've done is we've, we've tried to um, show people what we mean by cracked bricks. So let's see, let's see again if this works. We're not connected. Let's try to connect. So this is usually when, if Malcolm was here, he starts to see to fill the gap. Marshall, <laughs> you're not worried about what's going on in the background while we try to join some. Let's try something. Went wrong. I know it did. No, we don't want the seat. No. <laughs> no. I don't want. Don't want Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Right, let's go back, shall we? Right, we're here. Let's click on that. There. Now, if I was... I'll turn up the volume, but really it's cheesy music.
example, when we take the fuel out, when we put some instruments down to go and measure, we take some photographs, and we measure how they are slaughtered. So the this is a downward view, which is going into the fuel channel, so that these are the graphite bricks, and we can see the interface of these levels. I told you it was cheesy music, didn't I? So yeah, so, so we're inspecting, we take the fuel out, we go and have a look inside, and we then try to compare what the models predict to what we actually see. And, come on, here we go. Right, so, so this, this is the bit this is the bit. So if you can imagine a, a brick is about this size, about that high. It's not a house brick. These are the fuel bricks this size. And here we now we've got the side view. Um, and we go down a, a channel in two, 2017 and we're looking sideways as we come up. And we can see some marks in, in the graphite. Here's an interface. And here's a crack. Can you see a crack on the the right hand side of the picture. So this is a crack that's starting at the bottom of the brick and going all the way up to the top of that brick. And here's, here's another picture and we can see here this crack's a bit wider. And if you read in the press release when it says hairline, I did say hairline. Someone has added that word. Did, did, did these cracks are uh, one, two, three millimeters wide. This is a bit bigger, this one. Um, but we, we've still got the brick intact. And we've still got all of the connection between them. But the work that, that we do to try to predict where this is going to happen traces back all to the science that we were doing with the work here with Malcolm. So let's just skip that. Let's go see if we can go back. So uh, another example of what, what we try to do. So not only do we have did we have the contact with Malcolm, but we had lots of university links because although we're doing a lot of work ourselves, we want to try to interact with the key bits in different universities. And here's an example of where we've built a model computer model of the fuel bricks and then what we're trying to do is assess how they would behave in a, a seismic event. So again we run the computer model through and these bricks that we've cracked far worse than what we've got in the reactor and what we do is the code will tell us how they're behaving and then we'll compare that to the <coughs> distortions that we can tolerate and if you didn't like the 3D view, um, I've got a, a view from above. So we've gone from trying to understand what happens at the atomic level. So how can we model bricks, you know, half a metre high, a metre tall, and how they interact with the key system during a seismic event. So, in conclusion, the strap line is we will operate the reactors as long as it's safe. Thank you for the pictures about uh, Chernobyl. We don't want to have that in this country. We recognise Fukushima's uh, significant threat. Have we got our defensive right? But essentially, we're doing some technical work and we need external peer review to make sure what we're doing is right. And now can play a key part in that because. Um, I will miss his insights. He would often just come up and have a quiet word and say, have you thought about this? And then when you thought about it, you realise you missed something. So that's all I wanted to say. I wanted to show that the work that was going on was not just an academic exercise. It had some practical applications, and this is an example of where it fits in. So thanks very much.
Thanks very much, Jim. Do we have any questions? We're actually a little bit early, so we have time. If not. Good. That well, that was, was very, it was really clear. Well, it was a very <laughs> clear. <laughs> Yeah, Roger. These cracks that occur, yeah. um, are they, is it just because of the dimensional change due to irradiation, or is it something more fundamental than that? No, there aren't. It's two, two bits loose. So, so um, I did go into the details, but essentially the graphite shrinks, and because there's more neutron dose at the ball than at the outside of the brick, they shrink differently, so stresses get set up because of it. Um, we then get irradiation creep and that then leaves some of the stress and makes it more complicated. And then finally, um, because the coefficient of thermal expansion changes, when we go from hot to cold, we have thermal stresses as well. So it's not quite an easy thing to do. It's a combination of many things. It's a combination of all of those. Yes. Okay. Because it seems to me it was quite an unusual collaboration with Malcolm because he was doing theoretical modelling. Because this sort of work is quite typically with academic institutions, it's more with experimental groups. I mean, was there a reason for that? It, it was, well, um, it was unique. The work he was doing, trying to understand the behaviour of, of graphite at the atomic level, was important to us. So, that, so that's why we carried on doing the work, and again, it's nice to see one of the presentations, how the simulations got better and better, and we could do more and more understanding. Um, and, and so part of it was the work they were doing, but I think I'll go back to my other point, is often his technical breadth and insight was useful, where, where, where I could say, what do you think about some of the modeling we were doing here? He always had an opinion on how it would fit in how useful it would be. Mark, is there anything else you want to add? Because you obviously you, you, you sort of came down to see Malcolm a lot and talk yeah. about yeah. the program. Yeah, I think I was involved with Malcolm for about 20 years. Um, I think for me the perspective of what Malcolm gave to the work that we were doing was it was the insight of mechanism. Because a lot of what our regulator is after is, is not just our statements of what's happening, but why. Why do we understand it well enough? How do we know that something unexpected is not going to happen? And for me, that was what Malcolm gave a lot, and the work that he did right from the, sort of the dislocation movements and the, 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 you know, we'll hear about buckle, rock and tuck. Actually, that was unlocking the mechanism of the irradiation di dimensional change. And act, that has gone a long way to enabling us to be able to underwrite the material behavior that responds to the irradiation, that drives the stresses, that drives the cracking. So I, I once stood up, I uh, had a privilege of working with Malcolm also on um, an Innovate UK project on irradiation creep, and Malcolm and Tom Trevethan were working on that. And I actually stood up at the end of that and I said, I had the privilege of working on a project that went in length scale over seven orders of magnitude. <laughs> and Malcolm started at the bottom, but with Malcolm and Tom, he actually covered about three of those orders of magnitude. And he got us up to us in a millimetre scale. So, Patrick, some of these, these larger arrays that are being modelled now, I mean, that's what Malcolm was working with at the end, these much larger arrays. And it was actually starting in understanding space to take it right from these quantum mechanical calculations almost to the level that was now overlapping with these material experiments that Jim was talking about. So we've been playing catch up too in terms of the modeling. Uh, it was a privilege and I hope the collaborations will carry on. Thanks very much. Yeah, well, thank you again, Jim.